Hey y'all, it's Bear, and today I'm here to bring you my summer 2022 wrap up. So I have 21 books to show you. I really wish it was 22, because that would be funny. But alas, it is not. So I have not done a full seasonal wrap up in a while, so I wasn't sure how to structure this video. So I went on my Instagram stories and I asked, and a majority of people voted to do it by rating. So I'm going to start with the fives and work my way all the way down to the ones. Now within that, I'm also going to section it off onto whether I read it for like a readathon, whether I read it for a video, whether I read it for fun. So I'm just going to go ahead and tell you there are like a couple of key videos and stuff that I'm going to be mentioning in this. My 50 States Horror Vlog Series Part 1, my Full Moon Readathon Vlog, the Literally Dead Book Club, and the Read in Color Book Club. So go down there, check it out if you want more in-depth thoughts. Like I said, I have more than 20 books to get through today, so we're not going to have a lot of time to spend on each book. For my five stars, I have books that I read for videos. First is Catherine House by Elizabeth Thomas. I really enjoyed this. I thought it was a fantastic gothic story. It's kind of like dark academia cult with like a dash of science fiction. It's just got that little weird sci-fi element that elevates it from being like a straight up dark academia spooky book to like something more. I really like the way that we follow this character who at the start of the book seems to be a very active character and is like trying to learn things about the dark secrets of the school but as she is further indoctrinated into a cult you sense her becoming a little bit more apathetic. I thought it was fantastically done. Reprieve by James Han Matson. This one is pitched as an escape room thriller but I don't think that that's accurate at all. It is a thriller horror novel somewhere in between those two genres that is about a haunted attraction. It's like uh, one of those like spook houses that you go to in the fall. If you make it all the way through you get money. One of the contestants is murdered in the final room of the house and this is a multi perspective story of how everyone came up to the point of him being murdered. Everyone that was like connected to him in his life even though he's not the protagonist. I think he does a very good job with his social horror aspects as well as offering some like creepy situations and does unlikable characters in a really interesting and realistic way. This next one was a shock to me. It's A Head Full of Ghosts by Paul Tremblay. In this one we follow a young woman who is reflecting on her childhood experience where her sister was either possessed by a demon or schizophrenic and that exorcism was televised. Made to a reality show and this is how it's affected her whole life to this point. This book actually did really succeed in creeping me out and I actively made a decision to lose a full night's sleep to continue reading this book. Next we have one that is for a specific video but it won't probably be out until around October. So that is Ring Shout by P. Jelly Clark. However, if you do want to see more in-depth thoughts, I did vlog reading it for the Full Moon Readathon. This is a historical cosmic horror novel that weaves elements of different African spiritualities as well as cosmic horror and fantastical elements together. It creates a really unique blend of like graphicness that is very specifically tailored to these characters experience. It is historical like I said taking place in 1915 and we follow a group of resistance fighters who are working to take down the KKK but specifically the demons that have infiltrated the KKK and disguise themselves as such. It is the only novella that I have ever read that develops everything perfectly. I would consider this perfect. It spends equal amounts of time on character work, on plot work, on pacing, on setting, on the fantastical elements as well as the real world horrors. It's just, it's it's a perfect book. <laughs> then we have another one that I read for the Full Moon Readathon and that is Hell Followed With Us by Andrew Joseph White. This one I really enjoyed. It is a YA horror contemporary fantasy I want to say. It takes place during the Christian end times and we follow Benji who is a trans boy who has escaped his religious extremist compound who have started to force him to transform into the seraph which is supposed to save everyone. Benji takes refuge with a queer youth group of resistance fighters living in the city but the compound's gonna stop at nothing to get their angel back. It was so good. It was so graphic. There was a lot of commentary in here that I plan on rereading later in the year, probably in December, to like re-unpack. I want to go through and annotate this book. Um, but I think what struck me as the most unique is the sense of transitioning and being dysphoric in your body, whereas Benji's body is literally just like falling apart, puking up organs, losing skin, very graphic depictions of all of that. 
but I feel like that's what I really want to focus on during my reread. These next three I didn't reread for anything specifically. We have They Stole Our Hearts by Daniel Krause, which is book two in the Teddy Saga. And in the series, a group of sentient teddy bears wake up in a landfill and have to figure out their way back to their factory, their store that they came from, so that they can find a child to love them so that they can enter what is called the forever sleep, which is supposed to be like eternal peace. However, in this book, the teddies end up stumbling into a cult of teddies who believe that they were discarded because they were evil, they were bad, they were hurting the children. And we learn more of the lore of what happened that was the reason behind the teddies getting thrown into the landfill. And I can't tell you any more than that because other than that, it's a spoiler. Then we have volume one and two of Heartstopper by Alice Oseman. These are queer graphic novels, romances, contemporaries. I really love the TV show. I wanted to check out the series. I didn't know that there were like apparently four or five, but I really enjoyed the story of Nick and Charlie and their love and their coming of age while also dealing with the heavier topics. I feel like the relationship in this book is pretty light. The tone of the book is pretty light, but we do deal with heavier stuff like coming to the realization of your sexuality, dealing with aggressive bullying and homophobia in school, you know, toxic relationships, bullying, gaslighting, sexual assault and harassment. It's all handled in a way that I found to be very respectful, but also very realistic. Really enjoyed it. This is basically the first season of the TV show. I need to read volume three and four now so I can catch up for season two. Now moving on to my four star reads. The first two are for my 50 States video. We have another Daniel Krauss book and that is Scowler. This one is a young adult. Or I guess, I mean, the protagonist is 19, so call that whatever age group you want. I don't care. It's a horror novel that follows a boy who is trying to get his family to escape the farm that they live on. Um, after a meteor shower happens, which leads to his abusive father's prison escape. In fighting with his father and trying to keep his family alive, we also get flashbacks of our protagonist having his brother arrested and how Rai's imaginary friends helped him survive that initial encounter. And now that his father is back and the meteorite is affecting Rai's head, we see those imaginary friends come back. This one is graphic, this one is gruesome, this one really freaked me out with some of the body horror, but I am docking a star because I don't think that the language used throughout this book is necessary. We had some slurs thrown in, we had, you know, some casual ableism, and then there was also a weird thing with Native Americans toward the, like, latter half of the book, and I just don't think that's necessary. Then we have Shark Beach by Chris Jameson, which while it was a lot of fun, didn't really go out of its way to wow me. It is exactly what it sounds like. It is killer sharks who have been tested on by the government, who during a hurricane are released onto this Florida island. We have a large cast, perfect to kill off. You don't like a lot of the characters. It's just overall a good time. Ultimately, it just, it didn't wow me any more than I thought it was going to, and that's what I tend to save my five stars for. Another full moon readathon pick that was The Merciless Four by Daniel Vega. And in this one, we follow a girl named Berkeley who goes to Rome to join her friends on a college program situation after being released from a mental hospital. Her best friend killed herself and Berkeley kind of snapped from it. The first two Merciless books are the best in the series, and while these books, which are basically just like every mean teenage girl movie meets The Exorcist, um, are all very good, I don't think anything can measure up to the first two. I think book two is the best in the series, but this one ultimately was a good time. It was gory. It just took a while to get where we needed to go. Then we have Crooked Hallelujah by Kelly Jo Ford, which I read for the Reading Color Book Club. Thank you to Jenny for asking me to co-host. And this is a multi-perspective, non-linear novel told from three generations of Cherokee women. The reason I gave this a four stars instead of a five is I think that the non-linear aspect could have been done in a more crafted way than it was. I kind of felt like we jumped all over the place with this, but ultimately the themes of colonization, the normalization of violence against Native women are what bumped this all the way up to a four. I also really appreciated the depiction of how the trauma of residential schools trickles down. Then we have my Hellfire Book Club pick for August, and that is Darling Rose Gold by Stephanie Robel. This is a revenge thriller that deals with a mother and daughter. The mother is being released from jail after being convicted for child abuse because she has Munchausen by proxy, and it caused her to abuse her child to make everyone think that her daughter Rose Gold was sick. So this is dual perspective, this is dual timeline we follow Patty, who is the mother, living with her daughter, dealing with all of these things, thinking that her daughter is abusing her back and getting revenge, also not thinking that she's done anything wrong, while the other timeline, the other perspective is from Rose Gold, leading from the date of her mother's trial all the way up to her mother's release. I think that the choice to do this dual timeline, dual 
perspective thing was a very good one and worked in this book's favor. However, because it does ring so true to a real life case, I felt a little uncomfortable reading it. It's not like a retelling of the Blanchard case, right? But I feel like it could have been detached a little bit more from what actually happened. However, I think it's very twisty. The character work is really good. I like how you don't really want to root for anyone in this book, but you do. The book almost forces you to sympathize with characters that you don't want to root for, and I think it takes a very good author, a very talented author to do that. Then we have the last book that I read before I took my hiatus, so I guess I technically read this in May, but I never talked about it on my channel. That is Queen of the Tiles by Hannah Alkoff, and this is a YA mystery that follows a girl who goes to a Scrabble tournament where her best friend plays first the previous year and then immediately died at the table. So Najwa is coming back to kind of figure out the mystery of how her friend died, what happened. And it's just like peeling back these layers of everyone who had reason to go after her friend. But while they're at the Scrabble tournament, someone starts posting on the dead friend's Instagram saying like, you're next, it's gonna happen again. This is, you know, a clue, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. This is like the most Virgo book that I have ever read. I love a bunch of type A characters thrown together in a stressful situation. However, I was a little let down by the end. If the ending had been anything else, it would have been a five star. I'm surprised that I gave so many fours because I don't usually give out four stars. Then we have three three star books. We have one that I read for a video that was not out yet and it is a buddy read that I did with my friend Melita from uh, The Midnight Librarian. Go check her out. And then it is Black Tide by Casey Jones. This is pitched as The Quiet Place meets Cujo but I don't necessarily think that's an accurate description. It is an alien invasion locked room sort of horror thriller. So this is sort of like the start of an alien invasion. Basically the aliens didn't choose to come here, things just kind of happened with the dimensions. Follow Mike and Beth who are two very unlikable protagonists who are caught up in the middle of it on this beach in Oregon. So they go out after meeting and then hooking up, having a drunken one night stand to see like what's going on with all of these rocks on the beach. And it's there that they see a man disappear into the dunes, they see a police officer disappear into the dunes, and they realize, oh shit, it's aliens. There is a dog in here who I love. I was rooting for the dog the whole book. Just, I was like, that dog my number one. I think that Mike and Beth sort of start to grow on you a little bit as the book goes and you do start rooting for them to survive. I know that I did. However, I feel like this book was just a little too ambitious for a debut. I feel like the pacing is a little bit off. That was my biggest thing um, because the whole book does take place over like 24 hours, 36 hours, something like that. Then we have another Full Moon Readathon book that is Slip by Marika Makula and Atmata Pandya. This one is a graphic novel about a girl who is going to an art program for the summer and is also dealing with the fact that her best friend has attempted suicide right before she leaves. This book does really interesting things with color in the sense that it's a majority black and white, but the emotionally driven scenes are in red. And we get to follow our protagonist's exploration of grief through art in the sense that the art is now becoming literally like creatures. She is making these clay creatures who then come to life and attack her. So it's forcing yourself to like face your own issues, your own thoughts, you're trying to deal with it and then it physically attacking you. I really enjoyed it. However, I feel like the ending of this book wrapped up a little too quick and I wish it would have ended in a very different way had we just had like another 20 more pages. I think I would have been satisfied enough to give it a four or maybe even a five. We have Mayhem by Estelle Lauer and this one is basically, it's been pitched as The Crab meets The Lost Boys and there are some scenes that are literally lifted out of The Lost Boys film. We follow a girl named Mayhem who has just escaped her abusive stepfather with her mom to go back to her mother's childhood home. It is there that we discover that everyone in the family line has magical powers and they are now working to take down a vampire at this beach. This one just didn't do it for me. I found myself feeling very indifferent to all of the characters. I thought that the atmosphere was good, but it wasn't great. Pacing was good, it wasn't great. Everything was just good, not great. Okay, on to two stars. We have three two stars. Wax by Gina D'Amico. For a video not coming out anytime soon is a YA horror comedy about a girl who lives in this town of Paraffin. And in this town, the big popular tourist attraction is a candle factory. So Poppy, who is our protagonist, has auditioned for this TV show and basically made herself a laughing stock. Everyone in the town knows her. There's a mean boy who plays pranks on her. He 
puts a wax figurine of her in the town square. It upsets her. She goes to the candle shop to see if she can figure out who made it and how she can get back at him. While she is there, she encounters a strange woman and a bunch of really weird lifelike wax figures. She leaves the candle factory and whenever she gets out of the car, there's a wax boy in her trunk. Like, a walking, talking wax boy who is sent to be her protector. This is a really interesting take on the like cloning subgenre. However, because this was pitched as a horror comedy and it was published in the early 2010s, a lot of the references are dated and I'm fine with pop culture references in the book because for me it's a sign of nostalgia. However, there were so many in this that it just made it feel dated. Ultimately, it just didn't really work for me and it was just kind of a flop. However, the people on Goodreads love this if you're it's mostly people who have read gina d'amico before but they seem to love her she has like a whole cult following two more books that i read for the full moon readathon first we have the halloween tree by ray bradbury i think the only reason that someone would give this more than a two star in modern day is nostalgia i think if you were reading it for the first time today you would not give it anything more than a two-star rating. In this one, we follow a group of eight trick-or-treaters who get swept along this magical adventure through the ages on Halloween night by this strange man who lives in, like, a mansion in the town. Their friend is not able to go out on Halloween. We, on this magical journey, see a lot of, like, where Halloween traditions came from, going, like, all the way back to ancient Egypt. We see stuff with Salem witches. We see all kinds of things on this magical journey and each time this boy who is the one who could not go out on Halloween is stuck in a catastrophic situation and the rest of the boys have to figure out how to save him. It kind of gave me like a magic treehouse sort of feel without being any fun at all. I have just read things that are better than this for the age group in the exact same genre with a very, very similar concept. I don't think that this is good. It's probably my least favorite Ray Bradbury. And we have Monsterland by Michael Phillips Cash. This is a, how would I describe this? So this is a horror novel that takes place in Monsterland, which is an amusement park with vampires, zombies, and werewolves. It is a multi-perspective novel, both with humans and monsters. And it deals a lot with morality in a really interesting way. The owner of the park is compared to Donald Trump and P.T. Barnum several times. And in my interpretation of it, which I mentioned in the vlog, um, a lot of the monsters are representative for like real life minorities. So I think that just because this book tried to do so many things with character work, with pacing, with the the atmosphere and the mood and all of that, I just think too many eggs, not enough baskets. You have to figure out what basket your eggs are going to go in. You can't just take a carton of eggs, dump them upside down, and then expect all of them to fall neatly in a basket. And I feel like this was a very ambitious book that had a lot going for it, but ultimately it was just a little too much and it got cluttered and kind of messy. And then we have the one, I wore a yellow shirt just to talk about this book. My only one star read of summer, Hyde by Kirsten White. I hated this. I read this for the Literally Dead book club. Thank you to Kayla for asking me to co-host. I wasn't the only host who didn't like it, but I am the only one who gave it one star. And I wished that there was a lot to talk about, but there's not. I compared this book, I believe the exact quote that I said was, to compare the flatness of this book to cardboard would be an insult to cardboard everywhere. A group of 14 people are invited to this abandoned amusement park believing they're gonna be on a reality show for money and they soon figure out that they are part of a ritual sacrifice. That's the idea behind it. And I feel like the execution was just not there. I'm fine with unlikable characters. I've said that already in this video. I like unlikable characters, but you have to actually make your characters have unlikable personality traits. And by to do that, you have to give your characters personality traits. All of the characters in here were flat. The plot was almost non-existent. I did not like it. I found nothing redeeming about this book except the end pages, which I will now show you to give you something nice to look at. They're gorgeous. It's a map of the park. I do think that there were some very good points made on the live show. Two of my co-hosts gave it a four and five respectively, and then Kayla and I gave it a, a two and a one. I just didn't find anything about it compelling. I love the premise of this, right? The premise of a hide-and-seek amusement park reality show turned into murder is so fun, and then it just doesn't deliver anything. So yeah, a one. Worst book of the year? Probably. 
So if you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, share, etc. Go check out everyone and all the stuff I will leave linked downstairs. And if you want to join my Patreon, which is where we do the Hellfire Book Club. I can't see, so I don't know if I'm pointing at Darling Rose Gold, which is where we do the Hellfire Book Club. Go do that too. Comment question of the day. I want to know what the best book you've read this summer was, what the worst book you've read this summer was, and what's the most, like, fine book you've read this summer. Give me your best five star, your most mediocre three star, and your worst one star. If you don't have time, you don't have the spoons, you don't have an answer, you don't want to an answer, you can always let me know. You made it all the way until the end of the video by leaving me an emoji, preferably a yellow heart or a smiley face emoticon. And yeah, I hope you have a wonderful whatever it is, wherever you are, and I will see you next time with another video. Thank you for watching. Okay, cool. Bye. Let's get all these on the shot.